Welcome to this evening's live stream from Navara Media. I'm Dahlia Gabriel, your host for the next hour, and I'm joined by Michael Walker. Michael, how are you doing? I am. I'm excited. I'm, oh. I'm, this is my first co-hosting spot on Navara Live. So tonight we have a jam-packed show. We'll be talking about the racket that is British gas and our energy system in general, more flip-flopping from Keir Starmer and the total dysfunction of our criminal justice system. Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon made the shock announcement on Wednesday that she would be resigning. In her speech, she referred to, quote, a wealth of talent in the SNP without backing any particular person as her successor. So who's likely to be the next leader of the Scottish government? The bookies are already laying out their odds on the runners and riders for the top job. The front runner is close Sturgeon ally Angus Robertson, who is currently in charge of constitutional affairs in Holyrood. He previously spent a decade as the SNP's Westminster leader and was the SNP deputy leader from 2016 to 2018. While widely regarded as a safe pair of hands, there are questions about whether he has the charisma for the top job. One SNP MP told Politico that he is, quote, like an SNP leader from central casting. Another said they were, quote, not sure he's as popular as he thinks he is. Shots fired. Next up is Kate Forbes. She's been Scottish Finance Secretary since 2020, and at just 32 years old, she's considered a rising star within the SNP. Following the sudden resignation of her predecessor, Forbes came to prominence when she delivered the Scottish budget with just a few hours' notice. But some of her views are controversial, to say the least. She's a member of the Evangelical Free Church of Scotland, which is against gay marriage and abortion. Yikes. She was also amongst a handful of SNP parliamentarians who signed a letter against Sturgeon's Gender Recognition Act reforms. And in 2018, she said that politicians should recognise that the treatment of the, quote, unborn is a measure of true progress. John Swinney is Deputy First Minister of Scotland. Between 2000 and 2004, he was SNP party leader. And under Nicola Sturgeon, he's held a variety of top jobs in Holyrood. In 2020, he faced a vote of no confidence while he was Education Secretary. The following year, he faced another during the parliamentary investigation into the Scottish government's handling of sexual misconduct complaints against former First Minister Alex Salmond. Swinney survived both challenges. Hamza Youssef has been the Scottish Secretary for Health and Social Care since 2021. He's both the first non-white and the first Muslim cabinet secretary in Holyrood. And when he was elected in 2011, he was also the youngest ever MSP at just 26 years old. But he's had a difficult time as health secretary. In the summer of 2021, he was accused of being missing in action when it emerged that six out of 10 of Europe's coronavirus hotspots were in Scotland. Why? Because he was on holiday. Later that year, ambulance waiting times in Scotland rocketed, with the average wait hitting six hours. In response, he asked Scots to, quote, think twice before calling for an ambulance, a message that led to accusations he was putting lives at risk. Audit Scotland later claimed that there were 500 excess deaths in Scotland due to increased waiting times. Someone who won't be standing is Stephen Flynn, currently leader of the SNP in Westminster. He gave his reasons to BBC Breakfast. We've got a fantastic bunch of folk in, in Holyrood and in, in the Parliament in Edinburgh, an, an exceptionally talented group of people. Uh, and I've no doubt that there'll be a number who, who will consider themselves uh, as being capable of taking on the, the challenge of being leader of the, the SNP and, of course, First Minister of Scotland. I'm looking forward to, to seeing who comes forward and, and takes on that, that challenge. And I'll obviously be keen to, to hear what their uh, policy ideas are and how they intend to lead us to that, that independent future that I would like to see. Uh, does that include you? No, it doesn't include me, I'm afraid. Uh, as as your uh, your viewers will be aware, I'm a member of parliament in, in Westminster. The, the leader of the Scottish National Party has to have the ability to become the, the First Minister of Scotland. I don't have that ability based on the fact that I am located in London for, for half the week. Uh, so no, this, this, uh, this mantle, uh, this incredibly important role will fall upon one of my excellent colleagues in Holyrood. Uh, and and I wish them all well. So yeah. Have you got uh, someone you are backing already? So there's obviously a number of names which are being banded around in, in the public 
domain. But I think it would actually be a little bit unfair of me to to say that I have a have a preference one way or, or the other because I don't know uh, who's going to be putting themselves yeah. forward, and I don't want to add a, another layer of pressure onto them as they're doing their decision making with their nearest and dearest because this is a this is a big task, uh, and and they've got to be clear in their mind about what they want to do and why they want to do it, and they don't need me uh, putting any more pressure on their shoulders. Next month, there's due to be a special SNP conference on its strategy for independence. The conference was arranged after Sturgeon declared in November that the SNP would fight the next general election as a de facto referendum on independence. And that proposal seemed to be quite unpopular with voters. This is a poll of 2,000 Scottish voters by Lord Ashcroft polling conducted between the 26th of January and 3rd of February this year. It asked the question, should the next election be a de facto referendum on Scottish independence? And as you can see, 67% of those polled said no, with only 21% answering yes. Now, some SNP members, many of whom were unhappy with that strategy, are calling for it to be paused while Sturgeon's successor is found. This is Stephen Flynn again. We were intending to to plot our course going forward, not just for the SNP, but for the wider independence movement. In my view, that conference should be paused. We should allow a, a new leader the, the opportunity and the space to, to set out their vision, their priorities domestically in relation to the NHS, the economy, the cost of living crisis, but also give them the space to to chart their course when it comes to that that pathway to, to independence. Mm. I think it's the right thing to to take a take a breather. I don't think the public will be surprised if, if we do that. Uh, and I hope that that's the decision that, that's come to. Michael, do any of these candidates look like they could pull off the kind of electoral successes that we've seen under Nicola Sturgeon? I'm not in a position really to judge each candidate on on their merits. I don't think I have a deep enough knowledge of of any particular one of them. I mean, interestingly, sort of talking to my guests yesterday, so I had the editor of the National Laura Webster and then also Ross Greer from from the Greens. They were both quite insistent that the SNP electorate or selectorate, let's say, is quite liberal now. Um, so that was in the context where we were talking about the the gender recognition reforms, which have been so contentious uh, at the moment. They said because many of the social conservatives moved to ALBA or not necessarily social, people skeptical about gender reform moved to the ALBA party led by Alex Salmond. They thought it would be difficult for an SNP leader to change position on that. So Kate Forbes, there's been a lot of talk about her um, in sort of the Westminster press as being, she's an incredibly impressive politician. I imagine, you know, I can I can see a kind of Tim Farron type thing happening. Remember when he got elected as, as Lib Dem leader and all of a sudden he was being ridiculed essentially because he was leader of a liberal party and had some pretty conservative views about homosexuality and the like, also because of his Christian beliefs. I mean, I suppose uh, what I feel more qualified to talk about and I think what's really interesting here to people across the UK is... What does Sturgeon's resignation mean and what are these people going to be arguing about? And and to me, it seems that it's becoming, you know, in retrospect, while people while now people have slept on it, it seems a bit more clear why, and I, I can't read Nicola Sturgeon's mind, of course, but sort of the significance of her resignation, I think, is going to be a turning point in the SNP's strategy vis-a-vis a referendum. I've been thinking about this today and it's it's looking at the polls, looking at sort of the, there to me seems right now no route to uh second Scottish referendum in the near future. And there's not a stable majority for independence. And what this reminds me of is essentially the second referendum campaign when it came to Brexit. So yes, there were it, it was on edge. You know, it, it, it could have been the case that there would have been a second referendum to rejoin the European Union. But one, there wasn't a mechanism to get there. And two, it was so neck and neck that did we really want to go through those constitutional hoops to make it happen again? And I feel like Scottish politics is potentially settling in a similar position, which is to say, yes, if there were a second independence referendum tomorrow, it would be neck and neck. I I wouldn't rule out independence winning, but without there being an overwhelming majority beforehand, I can't see how it's going to get through the, the constitutional hurdles it would need to to happen. Because essentially, I don't see a way where they can get a referendum without Westminster granting it to them. And Westminster's not going to do that. Whoever wins the next general election is not going to grant Scotland a, a second independence referendum. They have no reason to. And so I feel like we're probably going to end up in a situation where the SNP are going to have to step back and talk about independence as a 10-year strategy as opposed to a, a four or five-year one. Um, I can imagine there being an interesting debate about 
Devo Max, because I can imagine that would be something that the next Labour government, if Keir Starmer is elected prime minister, would be willing to have a conversation about sort of increasing devolution, giving the Scottish government some some tax raising powers, for example, or more tax raising powers than it currently has. And I, I think that's probably from the position I'm in now seems to be how we are going to see the Nicola Sturgeon resignation, which is a new phase in the SNP's battle for independence, which is essentially saying, no, let's let's look at this as sort of a long game instead of Sturgeon was you know, quite intent on making every new electoral hurdle, one which would get the SNP closer in the near future to, to independence. And I feel like we're going to see a very interesting debate among the candidates about whether or not to change strategy on that. And I think you know, we're already seeing that with calls to postpone that special conference, which was going to be precisely to debate how to get um, Scottish independence in the next um, four or five years by calling that de facto referendum at the general election. And uh, we're going to see a change of direction, I think. It was obviously a really bold move by Nicola Sturgeon to kind of talk about the next election as a de facto referendum. For her, it's probably not paid off. But from a kind of Britain perspective, you know, the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon as well has always been, she's been quite a, at least in electoral politics, a force for quite progressive, pushing things in quite a progressive way. So I wonder, for me, sitting in England, the question there is, Will her successor be able to continue um, that role? But we'll be following this story as it unfolds. Centrica is a multinational energy supplier. It owns various companies, including British Gas, that supply gas and electricity across England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland. But it also operates oil and gas production in the North Sea. Today, they've announced their annual profits. Brace yourself. Centrica have earned a record £3.3 billion profit in just one year. That's the highest in its history. The Evening Standard reports this. Centrica, Britain's biggest energy supplier, more than trebled its underlying profits to £3.3 billion from £948 million in 2021. The previous record was £2.7 billion made in 2012. The profits were earned in a year when household and business energy bills rocketed to an unprecedented levels after Russia's invasion of Ukraine almost a year ago sent wholesale gas prices soaring. The Centrica results also come weeks after British Gas suspended the forced installation of prepayment meters over concern about its treatment of vulnerable customers. Concern about its treatment of vulnerable customers is a pretty mild way of characterizing British Gas's grotesque treatment of some of them. This video is from a Times undercover investigation into the debt collector Avato, which British Gas pay, use to pursue unpaid bills. Hello, British Gas or Gas Supply. We're here with the court warrant. Can you please open the door? I'm going to have a lot of love for you. It's the exciting bit. I love this bit. <laughs> On some of the coldest days in recent weeks, I was in teams of either four or five men breaking into families' homes and force-fitting pay-as-you-go meters for British gas. The debt collection teams are deployed after courts sign off warrants on behalf of the energy firms. The companies are meant to screen for vulnerabilities. However, we broke into this home, even though a neighbor had told us there was a single dad and three children living inside. We are not publishing footage from inside this home to protect the privacy of the family. The family was out, but on the living room floor there were toys for young children, Peppa Pig figurines, a small pink bicycle, and a mini guitar. In the kitchen, there was a child's Ventolin asthma inhaler and eczema cream. The debt collector leading the team did not seem phased by the signs that children were living in the home. For the benefit of court recording, uh, no inside property, uh, dog has been contained by dog handler, uh, no risks, no vulnerabilities uh, on site, uh, ending court recording now. The British gas engineer explained how he thought the family would probably get cut off from their heating. He said the account was in the generic name of occupier, so they might not automatically be sent a top-up card. He won't get sent a card, so he's going to go off the fly. Oh, what did he... Yeah, I think he'll send him a card. Oh, thank you. So he'll be £10 emergency, and then that's it, and then he'll go off the fly. The debt collectors sat on the family's sofa, and one messed around with the children's toys. After almost two hours, the job was done. The debt collector leading the team disappeared for a while, and the team waited for him outside. What were you doing? Toilet. Oh, right. 
The same agent offered me tips on judging a customer's vulnerability. But if they're just saying, oh, I'm a single mum and I got three kids and that, that's, that's not a vulnerability. Yeah. It is a vulnerability, but I'm, uh, I'm a bit old school and a bit hard nosed. According to the Times, Avato used prepayment meters as a way of bypassing rules that make it illegal to cut off people's energy. And they took a pretty narrow view of vulnerability. One trainer of new recruits said, quote, a person could tell you that their entire family of 50 were in a horrific aeroplane crash and they were the sole survivor and we'd still be saying, that's a shame, but we're changing your meter. In response to the investigation, Centrica's chief executive, Chris O'Shea, spoke to Sky News about the scandal. When did you find out about this? Good morning, Ian. Thanks very much for, for having me on. Um, I was made aware on Monday about the Times investigation uh, and took immediate action when I heard some of the allegations. We haven't yet had the full details from the Times. We've asked them for, for all of the information we've got so that we can have a proper investigation. The first thing we did was to suspend our VATO, the, uh, the contractor, I think it's let us down hugely. Um, the second thing was to launch an independent investigation led by our general counsel. And then yesterday morning, um, when we saw some of the information from the Times, what we did was we um, announced that we were going to suspend all prepayment meter installations under uh, warrant until at least the end of this winter. I just want to make sure that we can establish exactly what's going on. We've clearly got it wrong here. And we're going to fix that. We don't get everything right. We get more right than wrong. But when we get it wrong, we fix it. So I just want to establish the facts. Every single one of our customers deserves to be treated with respect. But how did you feel when you first saw this footage? Um, disappointed, livid, gutted. Um, you know, this is this is not who I am. It's not the standards I set myself. It's not the standards that um, I set in the company. It's not who we are. It's not how we do business. Um, there's no excuse. It's, uh, it's deeply, deeply disappointing. Um, quite distressing, what? actually. O'Shea might have found the investigation distressing, but not distressing enough to give up his bonus. His salary is just under £800,000 a year, and his bonus could be as much as £1.6 million. The Independent reports. Chief Executive Chris O'Shea refused to discuss his bonus as he defended his company tripling its profits amid spiralling energy prices, which have hammered families during the cost of living crisis. The company chief said on Thursday that it was too early to have a conversation about his potential bumper payout, despite pressure from campaigners to reject it. Let's get back to those massive profits, most of which come from North Sea oil and gas production, as well as electricity generation. Analysis by Sophie Flinders of Commonwealth has revealed that much of that cash is likely to go to investors abroad. This graph shows Centrica's 10 largest shareholders, a third of dividends will be paid to investors via giant international banks and asset management firms like BlackRock, Schroders and Ameriprise. That means that cash extracted from British customers and resources is going directly into the hands of wealthy investors and private pension funds, many overseas, and all profiting from the war in Ukraine. Michael, having record profits whilst breaking into the homes of vulnerable people to install meat gas meters, it's not a good look, is it? It's not a good look and it's not a good way to run society. Like I've, I've been talking to Aaron today um, for, for a downstream about like renting and, and rentiers. And it's actually the same story. Like I, I'm sick of rentiers. And so what is a rentier? A rentier is, is someone who, instead of making money by producing something, so by providing a service or by creating something useful, what they do is they put a fence around something that already exists and then holds everyone else ransom. So they have to pay them to use it. So a landlord, they didn't, create the house, they just had a big enough deposit to buy the house and then they charge renters to live there. People have to pay parts of their income to live there. And it's also you know, quite a violent process. If you, if you can't pay that rent, they're going to evict you and make you homeless. And we're seeing exactly the same thing with gas. Centrica, they don't produce oil and gas. They get it out of the ground, yes, but that doesn't, you know, they're making a lot more than they need to to cover those costs. So what they've done is they've put this, this legal fence around the oil and, and gas in the North Sea and now they get to hold us all ransom so we have to pay them to use it. Completely unproductive role to play in society. And again, here, a violent role, right? So you've got people who, who can't afford to pay this ransom that they've been demanding. And now people break into their homes and turn off their gas and tell them they're not vulnerable if they're a single parent with kids. That's not vulnerable. No, no, that's just people. That's just people wasting our time, right? Who, what's this for? This is not people who aren't able to pay for a really useful service that's being provided to them. Of course, if, even if someone is, is poor and struggling to pay for a haircut 
I don't really expect the hairdresser to, to, to work for half an hour cutting their hair for free, right? You don't expect people to provide a service if no one is paying them. But this is not to pay for service. This is to pay for some access to something which was God's gift, gas under the seabed. They didn't produce that gas under the seabed. This was bequeathed to all of us, you know, by the, well, by the natural history of, of the earth. They've laid claim to it. They make these huge profits, and they're especially huge when something bad happens. So these are people ex exploiting the, the, the fruits of, of war, essentially. So people are having this, this tragedy in Ukraine where hundreds of thousands of people are dying, being made homeless. And what do they do? They say, oh, this is actually a good time to have erected this legal fence around the oil and gas that happens to sit under the North Sea. And yes, we're not going to, even though we massively lucked out, you know, it's, what better role to have in society than to be the people who control the taps on something you didn't produce, but that everyone needs. Like, it's really lucky position to find yourself in. You've hit gold, essentially. I mean, gas, gold, oil, all, all, all very similar in this sense, right? You've hit something you didn't make, but everyone else needs. And not only are they reaping the profits from it, but when there are people who are unfortunate enough that they cannot afford to pay for that gold which you struck, you know, th th there is no sympathy shown. There is no one saying, oh, okay, well, we are making huge profits, so let's, let's count ourselves lucky and show some leeway when it comes to people struggling to pay their bills. I mean, I would also like landlords to do this. You know, we've been winning for the past 40 years. The price of our asset has been going up while the rent that's been paid for people to stay in the asset has been going up. Yes, if people are struggling to pay their rent and you're a landlord, what should you say? Okay, you know, I'm actually, I've been quite lucky. You know, I, I didn't build this house. I get quite a good deal normally. Now, if they're struggling to pay that rent, do not kick them out, right? Because you got a good deal and it wasn't for your hard work. You got a good deal through luck. If someone else is unlucky now, you should help them out. It applies to landlords. It applies to the gas companies. And I think it is disgusting that people are taking millions, billions in profits when they don't need it and then breaking into houses to stop people having you know, the basic things which are necessary for life, which is a little bit of heat in your house in the middle of winter. Keir Starmer has come under fire for barring Jeremy Corbyn from running as a Labour MP for Islington North. Party members have accused the Labour leader of running the party by diktat, not democracy, after the decision was taken without a fair or transparent process. This bypasses typical procedure, which hands this kind of decision to local party members. It also contradicts what Starmer himself said in 2020 when he tweeted, The selections for Labour candidates need to be more democratic. We should end NEC in positions of candidates. Local party members should select their candidates for every election. Nice if it was true. Allies of Corbyn have told The Guardian that he will still apply as a Labour candidate and seek the backing of local members, despite the hostile moves from the party leadership. In response to these events, Labour's former executive director of policy, Andrew Fisher, has published this piece today on NavarraMedia.com. And earlier today, I caught up with Andrew to tell us more about why he thinks Keir Starmer is a hypocrite. I mean, chiefly at the moment, I think it's around what he said in 2020, that Labour Party members should select their own candidates, no imposition by the NEC. Um, and yet he's just said, well, Jeremy Corbyn can't stand. And, you know, it's not like Islington North members have had a say on that. And in fact, even the NEC hasn't had a say on that. So even kind of party rule book hasn't been respected there. And then there's the kind of secondary uh, thing, if you like, which is about, you know, he said, I'm going to tolerate no racism, no discrimination, no uh, anti-Semitism within the party. And yet it's very clear that he's treating this exactly as a factional battle. And he has tolerated um, racism and indeed anti-Semitism, um, as long as it's from people in his faction and not from people on the left. So, for example, Diane Abbott um, was racially abused. The Ford Report said she was abused using overtly racist tropes. The people who committed that abuse are still Labour Party members. They haven't been expelled, or you know. So this zero tolerance seems to be very, very one-sided and factional. Um, and actually, that betrays what the Ford report found, which is you know obviously a, the QC or, or rather KC now uh, appointed by Keir Starmer to investigate uh, all of this. And he said there's a hierarchy of protected characteristics operating within the party. Um, you know, Keir Starmer yesterday said there's zero tolerance to all of it. We're not seeing that at all. So there's two levels on which he's hypocritical, at least. Do you think that this will be a problem for him in a general election? Or is this just a fight between the leader of the Labour Party and his members? Uh, I think it will be a problem for him because he's 
sort of is acted again this is again using anti-semitism as a factual weapon to try and tarnish the left using this entirely and he said you know anybody who wants to go back to 2019 you know can get out the door basically and and yet he was a prominent member of the labor party in 2019 he was in jeremy corbyn's shadow cabinet he was asking people to make jeremy corbyn prime minister he you know stood on two you know pretty left-wing manifestos um himself and you know in 2020 you know, stood on a policy platform that was pretty much summarised the key points of those manifestos, called Jeremy Corbyn a colleague and a friend. And yet now, this is some awful backwater of racism and bigotry that has to be purged and left behind. And yet he wasn't saying it then. In fact, he was embracing it. Um, so again, I think it will be because these contradictions have already been pulled out. You've already got Tory MPs tweeting footage of him saying, warm things about Jeremy Corbyn. You've got, in fact, the Jewish Leadership Council pointing out this hypocrisy and saying, well, how does Keir Starmer, you know, kind of, what's the word, kind of correlate these two these two positions, one where he stood in 2019 and, and two, what he's saying today. It doesn't, they don't square up. And I think that is a problem for him. This thing of sort of saying one thing at one time because it's convenient and another at another, I think is going to be a running theme of attacks on him. Do you think there's also an issue here of what does Keir Starmer stand for? Because obviously he stood on a very particular political platform uh, when he was running for leader of the Labour Party. And now it seems he's sort of moved quite far away from that. So do you think that issue of trust is not just about how he deal, how what he thinks of Jeremy Corbyn, but actually his his political positions um, at the heart of his of his agenda? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to cost him because I think the Tories are setting fire to themselves at a, a rate that is kind of almost unprecedented, really. And so he's almost certain to become the next prime minister. The problem with where he's positioning himself now, which is this kind of very kind of moderate New Labour light, really, kind of position, is that it won't achieve anything. And the And the real risk he runs is getting into power and disappointing people immensely very quickly because he hasn't got the sort of scale of programme, policy programme, that's going to solve the problems in the British economy. You know, there's no point identifying what's wrong under the Tories and then saying, well, we're not going to do much about that. Um, you know, and that's and that's the problem, I think, that Labour runs. One, it will disillusion people. Um, and two, you know, it just won't make things better. So, you know, he, he runs the risk of being a very short-lived prime minister if he's not careful. And how do you think that socialists who choose to stay in the party can really withstand the fact that Starmer is willing to use the party machinery to actually push them out of the party if they step over particular lines. What do you think is the is the strategy, given that he's willing to 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 kind of be quite ruthless in that regard, perhaps even more ruthless than Tony Blair ever was? Oh yeah, much more, much more. I mean, I think you have to go back at least to the days of Kinnock. Um, to find a kind of level of, of purging of the left uh, on this scale. And, and even then, I think this is probably in excess of that. So my my advice to people would be, and this is something, you know, I, I practice what I preach on this. I'm the chair of my local Labour Party. I think you have to build alliances, you know, build agreements with people where you can. Don't accentuate divides unnecessarily, but do fight for your, your beliefs. Do try and organise locally, both within and without the party, you know, Make sure that your local party has connections to the trade unions locally as well as nationally, if you can. Um, and try to, you know, as I say, just try to organise as, as well as you can, because whether you're in the Labour Party or you're forced out of the Labour Party, as we've seen with some people, um, you know, you want to be politically active and therefore you, you have to try and find ways of, of building alliances. That's an important thing, I think, in politics anyway. So, you know, clearly, if, if people end up getting expelled and kicked out of the party, they will have to find ways of working and, and building alliances around that. But there's no shortage of campaigns to support at this time. It's not like, you know, we're in a political uh, kind of you know, vacuum at the moment. We, we, you know, there's a big uprising of industrial action on a scale not seen since the 1980s um, at the moment. There's clearly community campaigns breaking out all over. There's lots of kind of mutual aid kind of activism to get involved in. I just say to people, you know, look, don't get wedded to whether you're in the party or not fight for what you believe in. And as socialists, that's what we've got to do wherever we can. And so moving away from the future of Starmer necessarily, uh, if Corbyn does choose to run as an independent in Islington North, do you think he can win? I mean, generally speaking, 
you know, uh, and we've seen this from people on the left as well as people on the right. It's difficult, right? Um, but I think Jeremy Corbyn, because he's been the MP there for 40 years, because he's been a very diligent constituency MP um, and has a large following, has a national platform, uh, because he was Labour leader, I think he probably would stand a very good chance. I don't know that he will seek to. Um, I, I think he's still, as a, as a statement yesterday and today, has um, kind of intimated, he, he still wants to stand as the Labour candidate. I don't think he's given up hope of doing that. I think that looks like a very you know, uphill battle if we're being generous at this stage. But clearly, uh, if he does, I think a lot of people will support him. And I think he'll probably stand a fairly good chance of being elected in the same way that if you look at Ken Livingstone's run in 2000 for the London mayoralty, because he had that platform, because he would kind of done the role before, he had that, um, and because of the injustice of the way he was blocked from standing, he had that momentum behind him, small m, uh, to be able to, um, to stand and to win. And I think probably Jeremy is in a position where he could do that. The problem for the for the Labour left is if he does do that, I suspect a lot of people end up getting expelled because they'll, they'll back him. Um, and that will then pose a question about what happens to the Labour left um, in those circumstances. Joint enterprise refers to a set of laws that prosecute an accomplice to a crime as if they were the main offender. However, what can be considered an accomplice is often not clear. This has resulted in bystanders and even people simply associated with the main offender being convicted of serious crimes like murder and manslaughter. Ethnic minorities, and particularly black people, have been disproportionately affected by the heavy-handed use of joint enterprise laws. Multiple studies have found that black men made up more than one-third of convictions under the controversial law. And in 2016, the Supreme Court ruled that the laws needed to be reconsidered as the law had taken a wrong turn and been widely misinterpreted. Despite this ruling, the number of black people convicted of murder under joint enterprise has increased. Today, the CPS finally agreed to record demographic data, demographic data for joint enterprise and to specifically monitor for racial bias. Earlier today, I spoke to Jan Cunliffe, director of Jengba, the organisation that brought the case against the CPS. I asked her about the impact of joint enterprise on those affected. Devastating, absolutely devastating. I mean, we're talking about young people who are being given life sentences for murder when they haven't even laid a finger on the victim. You know, when I was a young girl, I, you know, murder was with intent. You had to be the person that committed the murder. Uh, that's how I understand murder. And yet now, because of joint enterprise, you don't need the intent. You don't have to be the person that holds the weapon or uses the weapon. You don't have to be the person that plans it. You just have to possibly foresee that it might happen. That isn't justice. That isn't the justice system I was brought up to believe in. And it's not the justice system that we have right now, one that where, where we have um, a robust and thorough evidential bar. People are devastated. The entire communities are actually being wiped out at the moment. I do a lot of work in Manchester and, and the Moss Side area, and the young there, there's hardly any young men left. You know, it's like there's a generation of young people, young black men, that have disappeared from the area, and that is so immensely sad. And their families are devastated. There are mothers who'll never be grandmothers because their children have been stolen from them. And that is the impact of joint enterprise. And that's not even mentioning the life that a person has to have in prison. A life, you know, 10, 15, 20 years without them, their families, without the freedom, without their liberty, without having to, without a job, without all the things that is normal to us. And these are people who haven't murdered anyone. And, and that, you know, it's just, it's just beyond the imagination to, to even consider what that must feel like for people. Why did you get involved in, in the campaign and start up uh, Joint Enterprise uh, Not Guilty by Association, which is the, the organisation that you founded? Quite simply because it impacted upon my life. My, my son, two of my sons actually, both of them were charged with a murder that they didn't commit back in 2007. And because I didn't, I knew in the police station the questions that were being asked, who had actually committed the offence. Um, and it wasn't rocket science. It was a man who was kicked once, either kicked or punched. That was, you know, that was the evidence that the police had at the time. 
Um, and we had to go through the trial process and it was a six week trial. And I, you know, for me, I thought this is about whittling down and giving the victims the justice that they deserve, not actually about capturing five young people at all cost and finding them all guilty. So my son, one of my sons was 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 acquitted and the other one was found guilty. And, and to this day, you know, it's very difficult to understand why one was found guilty and why the other one wasn't. So um, listening to the evidence in the trial and listening to, to the nonsense that the, the prosecutor came out with, he, he portrayed them as a, as a brutal gang. You know, these, these were a bunch of 15-year-olds who were out on a summer's evening. Um, and I, I witnessed that firsthand. And I, it became really clear to me that there was something very, very wrong with our justice system. It was either my son's case was very unique and something had gone terribly wrong, or there was something very, very wrong with our entire justice system. And it turns out it was the entire justice system, not just my son's case. The CPS have now finally agreed to monitor joint enterprise prosecutions for racial bias. Uh, what do you hope will change as a result of that ruling? There's two ways that this can go. First of all, because they're sort of under their own scrutiny, they might start following their own guidelines um, and, and stop um, sort of targeting specific um, specific races because we do believe that joint enterprise really does target the BAME community, particularly young black people, young black men. Uh, and they may want to sort of prove to us that that's not what they do. So if they did that, that would be amazing because it would mean in the next six months there'll be lots of young people, young black men that won't spend the rest of their life in prison because they won't be targeted. So that would be a wonderful achievement if they could do that. Um, if those figures, if they proved us wrong in the next six months that they're not racially biased, because that to us would mean um, they've stopped targeting particular communities. But if they do come back to us and, you know, the findings, their own findings are that they are racially biased, then we work on that one instead. So whichever way the cookie crumbles, I think, you know, we're going to either get young people not getting charged and prosecuted in the next six months and losing their lives to prison, or we're going to find out who and why uh, these young people are being prosecuted and the numbers, the ages, the race. Um, and all the things that we've asked for. So, you know, we won that. We won that yesterday. And it's, you know, the next six months is all about continuing that win and to make our criminal justice system one that's fair and one that we can all trust. That was Jan Cunliffe speaking to me earlier today. Uh, you know, there was a few things that really come out to me in that interview. It was a really moving interview uh, for me. I think firstly, you know, we talk about how do we make change? You know, the Labour Party doesn't seem like a vehicle for socialists and progressive people anymore. I think looking at examples like Jan's where, you know, in a really difficult time, she organized, you know, in her community and got real change at the top, change that hopefully will have uh, a really massive impact in in so many people's lives and also she you know Jan also talked there about this kind of law and order rhetoric and we often think about this as just like discourse it's just language it's party politics it's culture war whatever on the ground that stoking up of law and order language has real impact you know there are people who are serving life sentences who were just just because of very loose associations to horrific incidents, just because they were bystanders or they were, you know, the friends of someone who was involved, who was, you know, they are, they're spending their lives in prison and that has such knock-on effects for the rest of their, their community. So it's really important that when we talk about law and order, we're really responsible in understanding, you know, what that actually means um, for the people who are going to be disproportionately affected by that kind of policy. In a major escalation of their industrial action, the Royal College of Nursing has announced that its members will strike for 48 continuous hours from 6 a.m. on March the 1st. The strike is due to affect more than 120 NHS trusts with tens of thousands of nurses walking out. Until now, nurses have only stopped work in 12-hour shifts and only during the day. But this strike will run over two full days and nights. And for the first time in its history, the strike will involve nurses working in emergency care, cancer wards and intensive care. Pat Cullen is RCN General Secretary and in a statement she said this. 
It is with a heavy heart that I have today asked even more nursing staff to join this dispute. Patients and nurses alike did not want this to happen. By refusing to negotiate with nurses, the Prime Minister is pushing even more people into the strike. He must listen to NHS leaders and not let this go ahead. At first, we asked thousands to keep working during the strikes, but it is clear that this is only prolonging the dispute. This action must not be in vain. The Prime Minister owes them an answer. These strikes will not just run for longer and involve more people, but will leave no area of the NHS unaffected. I will do whatever I can to ensure patient safety is protected. The escalation has filled NHS leaders with alarm. Sir Julian Hartley is the chief executive of NHS providers, and he told The Guardian this. This is the most worrying escalation of strikes yet. With more than 140,000 appointments already postponed as a result of the walkouts, this is a step no one wants to take. A continuous 48-hour strike with no exceptions in A&E, intensive care units or cancer care services will be a huge blow, especially as even more trust will be affected at this time. With further strikes by ambulance workers planned in the coming days and weeks and junior doctors walkouts also likely, trust leaders are now in a near impossible position. They're deeply concerned the escalation could hamper their efforts to tackle care backlogs and compromise the continuity of care for some. Without a resolution, this ongoing dispute could lead to serious long-term damage to the NHS. The government needs to talk to unions urgently about pay for this financial year. Also announcing new strikes this evening is the RMT. 40,000 members will strike on the 16th of March. That's across all of Network Rail and will involve 14 train operators. Train workers will strike for a further three days on the 18th and 30th of March and on the 1st of April. Network Rail members will also start an overtime ban that will last for six weeks. Michael, what's the government's end goal here? Like, surely the standoff can't continue and it's clear that the unions aren't backing down. So where is this going to end? I mean, it really is like a first time as tragedy, second time as farce. And you figure out, you know, Margaret Thatcher, her big war was with the miners. She's saying, we need to modernize the economy. We need to take down the militant unions. And it was brutal, terrible she won because it was a huge setback for working class politics in this country. But it did okay for Margaret Thatcher, right? The replay, the the Thatcher reenactment society, Rishi Sunak, genius that he is, has decided, I know who I'm going to go to war with to, to, to demonstrate my authority. The nurses. I'm going to go to war with the militant nurses. Now, does he know how ridiculous that sounds? There is no one in this country who is thinking, oh my God, these greedy militant nurses who are just trying to bring down capitalism and social order as we know it. No. What does everyone know nurses as? Very hardworking people who help you in times of need, who've gone through a terrible pandemic, you know, two years of sort of, you know, almost a almost a horror film, you know, the especially sort of those early days in the pandemic, what those people went through. And we all know the NHS is in the biggest crisis it has ever been in. Why, oh, why, oh, why would you decide this battle? Like it, it is, it's so ridiculous. It would be funny were it not for the fact that people will die because of this. And, you know, this is not to say They should not go on strike. They absolutely should go on strike because people are dying every week because the NHS is on its knees. And we've got to take the long view. The long view is that if we want the NHS to survive, if we want people, if if we don't want to have this collapse every goddamn winter, we need NHS staff to get paid properly. Because if they're not paid properly, we're not going to be able to staff that service. We're already putting them through a pretty hellish situation. I would hate to go to work every day and every night and feel like I'm doing my job badly because I'm so overworked that I can't possibly do it well. And I think that is the situation for so many people working in the NHS now. You know, you really care about what you're doing. The stakes are incredibly high and you are being put through a pretty hellish experience of, of having to, you know, knowing I'm not, I'm not doing the job as well as I want to be doing because there's too much pressure being put on me. That's what the NHS is like at the moment. The least we can do is compensate these people properly. But instead, Rishi Sunak has decided to go to war with nurses. It's, it's it's completely bizarre. Like, I, I can't work out what they're thinking. I don't think they're going to win this battle, but the longer they drag it out, the more political damage it's going to do to them and the more people will die, frankly, right? So it it it, it boggles the mind. It seems to me a complete own goal. It, it, they say, oh, well, if we get the nurses a pay rise, we'll have to give other people a pay rise. Fine. Well, one, you should give other people a pay rise. You know, if, if we're talking about what's right, yes, we should be giving everyone a pay rise in line with inflation. And if you're worried that's inflationary, oh, why don't we tax the rich, right? Because you can suck demand out of the economy. 
if you want to suck demand out of the economy, say because you're, you're worried about inflation rising, don't do it from public sector workers who are low paid and working very hard. Do it from the wealthy. Right? It, it would be a stroke of genius for Rishi Sunak to do this. I mean, this is probably the one thing that could save the conservatives so they win the next general election to say, you know what, actually, we are going to give the nurses the pay rise they deserve and we're going to fund it by taxing the wealthy who've done very well over the course of the pandemic. If you'd done that, they would win the next election. Obviously, they're not because that would destroy their coalition and they exist to serve the interests of rich people. But that would be the one thing that I think could save them. And it would also be very good for our health. It'd be good for society. They're not going to do it um, because we know what this government are like. I guess I can't figure out if this is, you know, an ideological, you know, just stubbornness or an ideological drive that, you know, they're just trying to deplete the NHS of all, as much as they can, that, you know, they know they're probably not going to win the next election. So they're like, well, let's just destroy it as much as we can. Or is it just stupidity? Is it just like lack of political savviness? Like, Michael, what do you think's driving just like the sheer unrelenting stubbornness, especially given the fact that we know that nurses in particular, you know, the public really back nursing strikes, you know, even more so than they back other sectors going on strike? Like, what do you think is behind the kind of refusal to relent even a little bit to even come to the negotiating table? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, is it dogma? Is it mm. the, you know, the conservatives reason to be is to not, I mean, because you would, you, you would have to raise taxes to pay for this, I think. You know, in, the, in, in the short term, yeah, you could, you could borrow more. But in the long term, if we want to pay people in the NHS properly, if we want to fund the NHS properly, we are going to have to tax the rich more. There is no way around that. So I suppose if you are the Conservative Party, you'll be saying, should we tax the rich or should we allow the NHS to crumble? You can see how sort of like with those two big buttons, they say, well, we would, you know, we would. it's a shame for the NHS to crumble, but we're going to have to press that button because we couldn't possibly tax the rich. That's not in our DNA. Our funders wouldn't like it. I mean, hell, I'm Rishi Sunak and I'm worth 700 million pounds. Why am I going to uh, spend any co political capital taxing the rich? I mean, potentially it's that. I do wonder if there's a bit of sort of treasury brain, you know, so it's uh, people in the treasury, the, the top civil servants there are sort of maligned for being bean counters. And they're just saying we, we couldn't possibly increase public spending. Um, and if we increase public spending for the nurses, I mean, the one thing they are right on is if they increase, pub if, if they increase the wages of the nurses, it's going to be difficult to say no to the teachers. It's going to be difficult to say no to all these other public sector workers. Now I say great because they should all be getting a pay rise. But you can see how if you're a bean counter in the treasury or if you're a conservative politician, that's going to be difficult for you. There is an obvious answer. It's tax the rich to give them all a pay rise. It's what the Labour Party should be saying, by the way. They're not. Oh, well. And yeah, I mean, I suppose the more I outline what the options are, the more it doesn't become surprising that the Tories are doing something so self-destructive because the only sensible option is something they, they cannot do. Um, but it, it's, it's bad politics. It's going to lose them the next election. Thank God it will. And it's going to be terrible for all of us in the meantime. It, you know, it's, in a way, it's good to see people fighting back and it's good to see a campaign where you think they should win, you know. Everything here is really in the nurses' favour. They have the upper hand over the government, I think. But it, it's also a depressing situation because we have a government that's so hell-bent on letting the rich off that they are going to degrade the NHS and essentially kill quite a lot of people. A lot of people have already died because of the crisis in the NHS this winter, and more people will if the government don't relent. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us for today's show. I hope you enjoyed your run in the hot seat of Navarra Live. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Dahlia, for having me. Thanks for thanks for joining me. It was it was also my first host as Navarra Live. I get a little, you know, for that. I'll give myself a pat on the back. Um, so thanks for watching this evening, everyone. Make sure to come back tomorrow for another 6 p.m. broadcast when Michael will be back in the hosting chair. Uh, for now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. Mm -hmm.